This is We The Sales Engineers Podcast, show 122. Welcome to We The SE's Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's going on, SE Nation? Welcome back to another podcast episode. I am your host, Ramsey Majaba, and uh, my invisible host for today is Bini Kinungo, and he will not be able to make it for, well, his own reasons. So... I want to talk about today's guests. So today we have Steve Foster and Rob Curley. They were at one point an SE sales engineers, t- uh, sorry, an SE salesperson team, and they worked very well together. And I wanted to really pick their brain. Uh, we've done a few episodes where about like AE SE relationships, and you know I've had Chris White talk about that. I've also had uh, it's Chris and uh, Scott from. Uh, Ales, uh, ales with sales, sales on ales. Uh, talk about it. So, I've never had an SE salesperson team come and talk about it. And I just, honestly, I just enjoyed sitting back and listening to the whole conversation. I really didn't have much, like, I didn't even need to be in here. I was happy to be in here to listen to them talk and highlight each other's strengths and, well, they didn't talk about weaknesses, but highlighting each other's strengths. So that was great fun for me. I hope you guys enjoy it too. Um, if you haven't signed up to the forum, do that. So as a housekeeping, uh, we the sales engineers.com slash forum. Great. A lot of good conversations are happening there. Um, so join up, check it out. It's free. You don't even have to sign up to actually read and read the content you just if you want to participate you will need to sign up so without further ado let's jump into the show what's going on guys mr foster mr curly how are you guys doing very well how are you i'm doing I'm well good. i'm oh. good as well thank you ramsey hey Stacey. so i got two folks on the call with me and we were just talking for 50 minutes and we we're pretending as if we just met each other uh so maybe I'll start with you, Steve. Can you introduce yourself to the folks listening? And then maybe Rob, you'll do the same. I certainly can. Well, I guess I'm the most important part of this relationship. Hi, I'm Steve Foster. I'm a, a, a sales engineer currently at, at Netscope. Previously, I was at Riverbed. And way back in history, I was at Cisco. Okay. And Rob? Hey, so uh, I'm Rob Curley. Um, I've held a couple of, sort of sales positions of varying capacities over the years. I'm, I'm currently at a company called Riverbed um, as a sales leader, managing um, four, five uh, five reps and uh, I cover about half the UK. Previously, I've worked at other SaaS companies like Adobe and Fuse. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on, Ramsey. It's my pleasure. So Rob, is, is or Steve, is Rob the reason you left, uh, yeah. you left Riverbed? Actually, um, no, Rob is not the reason, it, although he did help me with my decision to leave because um, outside of the professional capacity, Rob, I would class as a, a, a good friend of mine. So um, he was part of the consultation process I went through, um, making the di- very, very difficult position to leave Riverbed. I was there for 13 years and um, I, had, I, I had tenure and I had status um, and it was a very difficult thing to do. But um Rob helped me with making that decision. Nice. So I'm going to ask a question I ask uh, pretty much every couple. Um, so I'm going to ask you, Rob, how did you guys meet? How did we meet? So I guess, I guess the, the easy answer is is through work. But I think we probably where, where was, was our, when was our first coming together, Steve? Uh, well, I think it was probably the. Was it BP or Centrica, uh, one of those two deals you worked on first and then kind of went from there? Yeah, I think it was probably close. I was, I was trying to think of the very first time. It's like when you sort of see your wife from across the room before she knows she's your wife and you go, oh, well, that's the first time I met that person. But it's a, that's a bit too romantic, this sort of conversation since Steve. Yep. But I was kind of searching my brain for that moment. So, um, no, we've got, a, we've got an office out in the sort of outskirts of London that we, we usually met on, I guess, a weekly basis where... Um, get sales and the sort of um, broader functions, you know, work and every Monday we kind of get together and, and sort of do some sort of chest puffing and strutting around the office of salespeople and, you know, 
hop into people's personal spaces we used to and start chatting. I think we sort of found ourselves sitting opposite each other, Steve, one day, didn't we? And I probably you probably strided over and said, "Hi, I'm Steve Foster. I'm the best pre-sales guy in the UK." That's probably yeah, something well, like. I think actually at the time I was leading the pre-sales team in the UK. That's probably where you um, you needed some of my resources as a pre-sales leader, and you had to ask me very nicely for an SE. I probably did, didn't I? Yeah. And, then, and then you probably went, no, you don't want any of those guys. You want to work with me. Well, yeah, there might be something to do with it, yeah. So, like, initially, you, you guys were not partnered up as an SE sales uh, person. No, no. Riverbed had a slightly different approach. So we went through that period at Riverbed of one-to-one -one alignment. Um, and we then kind of moved on from that to a pooled model with the pre-sales and the sales guys. So as an SE leader, I was responsible for aligning the SE resource with the sales resource. And um, to be honest, I think it was a bit of a disaster. Um, it never really worked very well because um, there were always favorites and you're always trying to pull people off the bench when they were um, already aligned or tied up with a, another deal. So um, actually, ultimately, um, I moved out of leadership and moved back into the field. And that's where Rob and I really started working closely together. Um, we started doing some business together and um, yeah, we had spent some personal time outside of work, outside of the country. Cause you know what it's like when you travel, right? You spend time with people um, and um, yeah, you get to know someone. And at that point I realized that Rob's actually smarter than he looked. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that. That's where the first lie in the podcast is. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, and I think, I think that gets to the crux of it, right? So as a, as a sales engineer, I am a sales engineer. I'm not a systems engineer. Rob will tell you I'm not the, um, the, the, the deepest tool in the box. I've got a set of skills that I think uh, align themselves to sales engineering rather than systems engineering. Um, but uh, yeah, as a, as a sales engineer, um, you, you have to identify recognizing sales guys, the ability to understand the problem when you are trying to solve it. And some sales guys don't care. Uh, and it's all about the, um, the deal and what it takes to close it. And some people un want to understand the problem and understand what is potentially needed to resolve it. And, um, Rob's actually one of the latter. He's a smart guy. Um, very, um, modest, doesn't necessarily acknowledge the fact that he, he does understand a lot of the technology, which makes him quite um, dangerous as a, as a sales guy. Nice. That's a, all right. You guys are complimenting each other. Uh, let me pause it there uh, for you, Rob, when, when it was moved from one to one SE salesperson relationship to a pool model, what did you think was good about that? What did you think was bad as a salesperson? Um, so, so I'll be honest, it was before my time coming to Riverbed, whereby it was moved from one to, to the other. But I have had that set up in previous roles where I have had a dedicated SE and then then obviously as part of working with Riverbed, had a, had a broader kind of set of people to work with, depending on the opportunity, right? And um, there's, two, there's two things here that I'll, I'll mention. Maybe it's not a good and a bad thing, but it was a thing that I noticed between both companies I worked at. Where I had a dedicated um, pre-sales person to support me and work with me at my previous company, I think it was Adobe or Fuse, one of the two. Um, they were both essentially point products. They, they did the one thing they did and they just were rinse and repeat. You'd go from customer to customer, essentially selling one thing after another. And there'd be very little sort of breadth of portfolio to which to kind of upsell and cross sell and um, very little deviation in the conversation at the start of a customer, you know, customer chat. But that worked well because you, you essentially knew the path you were taking every single time with the same person. And the relationship, you know, I'm a pretty easy guy to get along with. I didn't really ever have in my career any difficulties with people. I think um, I've always worked for good leaders that would sort of pay me up with the right person and they would always sort of work, work well with that. So I can't say there would be, I've noticed, I, I never had a relationship that I could talk about poorly with the pre-sales guy because I've been pretty lucky in my career guy or girl um maybe why that didn't work so well at riverbed in, in 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 my sort of view is that river is a portfolio business has a number of different products we sell and it's very very hard i think steve would probably be, you know, attest to this is that 
you, you would spread a, a mile wide and an inch thick on your product knowledge. And that really led to running into a number of different problems if you had a, one person you were relying on because that person themselves would probably class themselves as a jack of all technical trades rather than a master of none. And then you could only go in a few conversations into the, into the sort of sales cycle with a client before you had to probably go and get a guy with a really deep level understanding of that particular widget before you went forward and, and you probably have to bring another person into the room with the client conversation. It kind of broke some level of what's what I'm looking for credibility um, with that, you know, pre-sales guys knowledge that you had to bring in another person and you started looking like you were working for IBM because you had a very quickly a room of five, six, seven, you know, Te technical smart people with a sales guy trying to orchestrate that conversation, a pre-sale, a sales engineer like Steve, you know, um, almost stepping into the sales field because he's trying to manage technical resource in the meeting as well. And so you know, I never really had any challenges with the people and the, the, the kind of personality side of things. Like what I found the, the, the really big, obvious challenge was when when you had a number of products to sell going to a one-to-one -one alignment did kind of break that um that ease of use of that model because you just no matter how smart you are no matter how tenured you are i think you were 12 years steve by the end of it with, with Riverbed. You, you i remember working on a few a few deals with you and you were you know openly like out, out of your technical depth and quite right yeah, no, absolutely yeah yeah I, I i don't refuse to be the the, the expert on everything when you've got upward of 12 products to go and sell, you can't necessarily be that, that expert. Uh, and I can't believe for a second you didn't run into people where perhaps you, you um, had a bit of headbutting with them, Rob, because you ask why a lot. And I think that's the, that's the important difference is that you question and you, drove, you drive people, you certainly drove me to, to make sure I was doing the right thing because you knew enough to be dangerous and you were asking me why. And a couple of times I remember we we never stood up, you know, face to face, chest to chest. But a couple of times it got a bit heated with respect because mm. you questioned my uh, approach to something. Um, and I questioned your desire to to change it. Uh, but because you did it from from the right with the right intent, because you actually knew what you were asking. And the same of me. Right? I asked you a couple of questions at times about qualification and why are we doing this Be because I had an understanding of the sales process and I couldn't necessarily see through clearly to the to the end um, and I think that's why perhaps it worked so well because you you understood where I was coming from and equally I had an understanding of your perspective it's not like I was just a techie and I went no that's sales I don't touch it mm -hmm. and the same as you were you weren't just a sales guy I went no that's technical I'm not interested well, I think uh, you know that's yeah, I think you kind of bang on with your remarks there, mate. It's it's quite interesting the way that our relationship evolved in that I think from across the room for the first sort of six months of getting to know each other, that's quite a long time, two quarters, you know, in my mind, you know, you get to know a lot about someone professionally in that a length of time. But, you know, we, I think, very quickly established that, you know, you, you, you built a level of respect in the company that, you you, you know, people could question you uh, but it was always with the level of, you know, Steve's probably always going to be right here, you know, because you, you've seen a lot with the company, you've probably seen a few cycles that look similar, you've seen a number of conversations and the questions that look similar. And, um, you know, I think when you get to that point, there is a level of gravity, you know, a level of kudos, level, you know, kind of untouchability that you kind of got to in, in Riverbed because you, you did know most of it, right? Yeah, but you don't always respect that out, off the gate. You, uh, you have to respect, you have to exactly. earn respect with you. You don't, exactly. you don't respect someone because they've been there for 12 years. You, you question someone's ability or integrity from the, the moment you walk in the room. And I've seen a couple of instances where you've been in sales meetings questioning VPs at the front of the room and their strategy and their approach because to you it doesn't make sense. And the same as you do the same for me from a technical angle, you'd mm. question my approach to it. So that questioning I, I respected because that's, that's just the nature of someone with a, te with a technical approach to doing their job. And the, the thing that you did that, that sticks with me to this day is you weren't afraid to earn my respect. You didn't need to. You did, I was just an ordinary rep, no big CV, no kind of evidence of any you know, reason why 
you, you should have respected me, but you worked really hard to show that you were, you know, a person to be respected. Um, and that sort of set me off with on the right term. I was like, this, this guy's a professional. This guy wants, wants respect. He will show that he, he needs respect. Uh, he doesn't need respect, but he, he wants respect for all the right reasons. And um, that instantly made me respect you as a professional, right? And made me think, right, this guy cares about his work and he cares about his colleagues. And that was that was the kind of big kind of tipping point for me when I thought, if there's, if, you know, if there's pros in this industry, Steve's one of them. So, so I guess going back to the purpose of this um, podcast, when you look at the relationship between sales and pre-sales, it's ultimately about mutual respect. Mm. As far as I'm concerned, um, I could see uh, we, we had a couple of run-ins in the early early stages of, of our working relationship where he would question me and my my approach to doing something um, and force me to qualify it and make me feel uncomfortable and, and justify it. Um, and the same I would do for him. So it might have appeared from the outside that perhaps we were kind of jostling for status and position but actually what we were doing is establishing the level of understanding which is why from then on when we did work closely together it very quickly ended up being that we we could trust one another like um mm. i i spent i don't know how many weeks did i spend in houston of all humid places far too many for, for my own good but but I was able to do that and relay back to Rob from an Intel perspective, from a sales Intel perspective, um, because he trusted yeah. my understanding of the sales process and who I needed to be speaking to and building relationships with. And mm. the same on the other side, when I needed him to get me in front of the right people to make the right influence. So like, there's a lot to unpack here. And I, I just enjoyed sitting back and watching you guys dissect your relationship i didn't have to ask any questions which was awesome uh, but when rob challenged you steve did you change the way you were doing things or did you stick to what you were doing and still earn the respect like how did um, it work yeah well that's good because because it's not i've been there a long time right I, but i've i've set status and built status with one particular sales guy so my history at riverbed was uh, was long but I'd spent eight years working one, with one particular sales guy who is still to this day working at Riverbed and is still known as the metronome because every quarter he delivers on a number, year in, year out, quarter in, quarter out. And we did that for eight years, overachieved 200, nearly 300% of target, which is easy when you're selling the technology that everyone wants, I grant that. Um, but he still built a level of respect and knowledge and, and intimacy with him um, which I was then able to then start judging the behavior and the, the execution of other, other sales guys. So when he questioned me, I knew it was coming from a, a position of um, a, a, a need to understand where he could trust me because he needs to be able to trust me because if he gets me the right meeting with a C-level executive inside of the accounts that he spent a long time building those relationships with, the last thing he wants is to bring somebody in that is going to ruin that relationship within a half an hour. Mm. So I knew he was coming from a position of needing to be able to, to, to trust me. So I, I didn't, while, while it's, it's difficult to, uh, to um, accept it when someone questions your status and your, your understanding, your knowledge, um, if you've been around this industry long enough, you can see why they're doing it. And I could and understand and realize why they were doing it. So while I saw it as a challenge, you know, okay, bring it on. I'll, I'll, I'll show you what I know and how I can, talk you through the makeup of a deal and where the responsibility lies and where the, um, uh, the, the time spent. I, I know, but that I, I understand it well enough um, that I should better prove to you just by explaining it, that I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to put you in a position where you're going to be bringing me into a, 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 a crucial meeting where I'm going to, embarrass you and we, we had exactly that that one moment we had sat in houston rob where we had some key decision makers around the table in a small room with a whiteboard and we had that moment to get the right people on board um and it's those moments where you don't talk over someone i know it's very difficult to understand when you listen to me talk and the amount i talk but i do know how to show i do know when to stop talking yeah when when it's not my not my place because I am not the person who should be asking questions about authority, whether it's 
um, you know, the ability to, to sign off on a project or whatever it is that, although I understand the process, I know when those conversations are about to start and I step back. So Rob, based on what Steve was saying, did you work with an SE where you challenged them and they took it negatively? And is the reason you're challenging them just so you can trust them or is there another purpose behind them? You're, you're trying to figure out something. Yeah. The last bit there, I think was kind of where I was going in my head with, you know, I'm trying to figure out something. And I think, you know, just more broadly speaking about professionals, not just sales, you know, sales engineers and sales people, you know, I, I kind of walk the tightrope in life where I'm trying to, challenge people a little bit just all the time and that you know sometimes blows up in my face and you know i make some you know, you know I, I do i do break a few eggs but what i'm trying to do is work out how brave you are you know in a professional capacity how brave are you because when we're in an important situation have you got the bravery to say i don't agree with that and it might stop you winning a contract or it might stop you um you know, opening a door, something like that. But if, if you're, if you have the confidence and the bravery to, to essentially state your belief with backing and sincerity, I believe the right customers will respect that and the right customers will, will they are the right customers you should be selling to. If someone doesn't respect that bravery to ask the sincere and correct questions, you know, that that's, that's a real kind of turn off for me as a, as a person and a professional, right? I think that's, that's something I was trying to work out with, you know, when I was sizing up people generally when my first six months of Rubed, I, I was trying to work out who the brave ones were, the ones that I could take into the big, the big conversation with me and any conversation with me really, because, you know, I, I need, I need to be able to, to work with people I think can, can work well with me. And, um, that, that was really all, you know, what I was trying to achieve with Malt, you know, you know, as many people as I could, I think it really helped that we, you know, I was brought into the company by a really brave leader in Connor. I think Steve would, would, would respect, you know, respect that. And, okay. you know, I think we, I think we, I think we created a, a kind of a, a sort of a subculture of people that were, weren't afraid of anything really in terms of a, from a professional capacity to, 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 to do with customers and to, to do internally, because we, we, we felt that we had the, the sincerity and the, the intent to be able to, you know, be brave in the, the things that we talked about and the decisions we made to try and do best for the company and do best for everyone. And, um, you know, that's all I'm trying to work out with someone when I'm trying to work with them is, you know, I, 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 there's a, there's a bunch of really, really talented pre-sales and salespeople out there, but you know, a lot of them sort of look, you know, they don't, they don't have the, the confidence sometimes and that's not their own fault to be able to share their, uh, their point of view and sometimes it's up to you as a, a salesperson to bring that to bring that bravery out and people to be able to share what they want and um to be able to um you know feel confident enough to be able to demonstrate their, their skills and their, their their abilities and steve had that ability and that you know that bravery from day one and that was that was just the sort of thing that i needed at that point in my sales career was was a steve a brave smart technically very competent bloke and it was just it was it was yeah it, that, that was really the intent of my, of my whole kind of getting to know steve and in a professional capacity and then on a personal level you know you, you, you sometimes are surprised by people's sort of personal views and personal kind of you know character but steve's a very brave person in, in, his, in his personal life as well so it's it's like you know if you sometimes I like to be able to get along with the whole person rather than just the professional. And, you know, in, in, in getting to know Steve, it was like getting to know the whole person while you're at work. And that, that was a really, that was a really nice thing for me because some people can be a bit closed book outside of, you know, doing the job. And um, yeah, you know, that, that, that was sort of big, you know, a big, a big thing for me as a, as a, as a, as a young salesperson at that time in my life, you know, it's really, really kind of reassuring thing that there are people out there that, you know, are brave and really, really capable. And it gave me confidence as well. Um, Steve, how, how did you become so brave? Like, and is it genetics or is it something you had to work on? Well, yeah, good question. I think there's a bit of genetics in there. Um, just my challenging nature. Uh, there, there are people in this world that would, would say that perhaps 
being so challenging isn't a good thing. You know, asking why a lot doesn't always get you um, the, the easiest route into where you want to go. Um, but it's, it served me. Um, and I, I, I do it with a sense of knowledge. I don't tend to just, um, ask. You're not a fire, you're not a fire starter, not a deliberate No, fire. indeed. I don't, I don't, I don't do things deliberately just to try and instigate conflict. Um, you know, I, I've been around this industry, oh gosh, 20 years. Um, which is, which is if for a career is, is a, is a tenure. It's, it's not like I've just been in it a few years and I've not learned the hard way. I've been through a number of sales campaigns in, um, large uh, tech companies, um, like Cisco, you know, arguably Riverbed was a large tech company and I've worked at a very small startup where you, you have to be, um, humble and I've, I've done it. I've done a lot of, of sales training. And for me, the challenge of sales training was probably the best, sales training I've, I've been through um just just start asking customers why they do it in a certain way or why they their their thoughts are a certain way because it doesn't it's not necessarily conflict you're just helping them understand their, their train of thought and, and why they're doing things a certain way and if you learn how to do it the right way you can you can help um enlighten everyone in the room as to as to why maybe it's not the best way or why is the best way there's, there's no wrong, r reason you can't ask why and just say at the end of the, the end of the conversation actually do you know what that's absolutely the way that i would do it as well um mm. given the the circumstances because we don't always know the the reasons why and i've i've had some personal experiences outside of work that have maybe also formed um my certain approach to life um and, and, and my backstory is it is what it is, but um, I think that makes it makes a, a big difference as well. Being a little bit more mature in life can can help you be a little bit more um, willing to to share or question someone's approach. Um, certainly, being a parent helps that, and I'm sure Rob will discover that when his kids start themselves asking why. You know, at the moment, his, his daughter is, is young enough to be able to tell her what to do. And if she's anything like her father, she probably won't. But, um, she, you know, when they start getting to that age of eight or nine or ten, when you say, well, just do that. And they go, well, why? And, you know, that, that kind of in life, I think, is, is, a, is a, good, um, a good approach of just doing, of, of wanting to understand why someone do, does something. I mean, if they tell you, with a legitimate enough purpose then you you accept it but yeah i think going back to to what rob was saying um i have been fortunate enough to work in with people that have given me the airspace to become who i am and what i am the the, the sales guy that i worked with for, for eight years a guy called tom kine uh, a call out a shout out to him because he, he's one of those sales guys who is stealthily sits at the back of the room and just asks all the right questions uh, at the right time without being um, overbearing or um, over um, uh, pressuring and customers just tend to open up to him. And he leaves talking to the pre-sales guy and lets the pre-sales guy build a relationship with the customer, build, build respect with the customer, and then just um, springboards off that level of respect and knowledge. He makes sure he brings the right people in. He brings people in that know, know what they're doing so that the customer trusts them. And then once the customer trusts them, then that sales guy's gold because then you can then start asking from them the things you need around all of the typical sales budget, you know, need authority and all that sort of stuff. Um, because there's a, there's a, um, there's a, there's a relationship you've got with the vendor then because they trust the, the pre-sales resource. Would you say you guys have similar personalities because you both challenge with a purpose? It's not like you're challenging for the sake of challenging. There's a reason behind your challenge. But in general, do you have similar personalities or totally different personalities? You just made it work. Yeah. Why did you click it? Oh. As, as, Steve, if you've got some rounded thoughts, I'm sort of thinking as I'm listening to that, but go ahead if you can. 
Uh, yeah, I'd say I'd say we do. You know, it, 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 we, I enjoy the I enjoy the. We, we've had a number of conversations. We've had time to spend together outside of work, <laughs> sat in hotels in uh, in some. Well, we've been some places, haven't we? We've been Singapore. Yeah. Um, we've had the long haul trips to Singapore and Houston, and uh, obviously in kickoffs and stuff. We've been over into Vegas, and you you get to spend time with people and and really see what makes them tick. And personally, um, politically, emotionally, and yeah, I'd say we, we, there's some some similarities there. Not not, you know, we're not certainly not um, twins. Obviously, I'm better looking than he is, but um, <laughs> uh, but no, I think I think there's enough common ground there that we we can disagree, but ultimately we'll come back to the same level. And I think that's probably the same per- professionally as it's personally, which is maybe why. It works if if we were both so different you know if he was the 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 non detailed type who was not interested in the the why stuff needs to happen he was just interested in the when we wouldn't get on because he'd be forever just going come on then when we're going to do this when we're going to do that and when I told him why we weren't going to do it he'd be like that's too much detail I'm not interested move on and he actually respected my perspective and under and my point of view and was willing to listen to it then he'd say. Fozzie, that's not relevant. Bury it. Let's move on. But at least he listened to me. Mm, yeah. No, I never thought about it like that. But yeah, I, I agree. I think I think we are relatively similar, right? From as much as you can be. Um, the thing I think that we are similar from a personality point of view on is uh, we, we definitely care like a, a lot about everything we do. Anything, you, anything that goes has your name on it. Anything you touch you care, you, you really care. And, you know, I think professionally and personally, I've learned a lot in the last few years about how little people can care about stuff that has their name on. And I think, you know, not, not to, you know, give any examples because you know, I, I can't really think of any off the top of my head, but you can think of times where you thought that person, they're going through the motions there, that, that they are just going, you know, along to that meeting because, they, they get paid to go to meetings or they get paid to do that training or they get paid to, to, to kind of sit in that, you know, internal meeting. And, I, and it, from, from anything, from any, anything that's Steve or I talk about myself, anything I or Steve touched, I, I felt that there was always a, you know, why am I here? What can I add to this? If I can't add anything, you know, should I be in this meeting? Is, is this really for me? Could I be, could I be doing something better somewhere else that's going to, move the ball down the field for the company or me personally. And, you know, I think that, I think that is, is an important thing that we, we struck up a really kind of sincere relationship on, which was, you know, I'm not going to, if you turn around to me, Steve and say, Rob, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be having this conversation. You shouldn't be in this room. Just, just, just leave this one. I think we had a few, a few customer calls like where, you know, I, I thought we were onto something uh, yeah. and you turn around and go, Rob, you know, you're, you're kind of re- you're, you're you're selling to yourself here. You're you're really kind of you're pushing on a closed a locked door, and you know I had a different view on it. And I would always, with someone like Steve, and mainly with Steve, just sort of sit sit back and think, well, why Steve? Why Steve saying that? It's because he cares, and I think it's because he's seen this conversation before, seen this before, and he's, he's probably got a bit more depth of experience than me with, with this sort of thing. So you know what, you know. I'll, I'll, I'll take I'll take that as a as a caring statement, and I think that that kind of forms a lot of the kind of foundations of your professional kind of work, right? If you really really care, you're usually going to do well, and you're usually going to find people that care about it, stuff as much as you, and you tend to to gravitate to one another. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, I, yeah, is that right? That conscientiousness is important, but you can see it in someone else. If you if you are putting a hundred and you're putting a hundred percent in. And the person you're working with is not putting 100 percent in. You know, we and I've got a fantastic photograph of of us sat on an airplane with with Rob, Rob a row in front of me, with me with a yeah, with a toddler playing playing bongo drums on my head, with him laughing um, quite <laughs> obviously at glee that me stuck for the next nine hours with this toddler behind me. <laughs> But we, but but we we both committed to that, and we had to spend that time traveling. If if I'd done that for no purpose, and with Rob going, oh, do you know what? I'm just gonna, you know, I get paid, I get paid the commission, so I'm gonna go and sit up the front, and and you go sit at the back there. There was there was none of that. 
you know, uh, uh, it was, it was, uh, do, we were in it together for that level of respect and, and, um, and consideration it, it, because of that conscientiousness. It's a question for you then, Steve. Uh, have you ever been wrong about a salesperson where you thought you knew someone and it turns out you didn't? Uh, let me think. Um, no, I, I think I've been a pretty, pretty good judge of, of character as time's gone on where you can spot someone who's in it because they care or someone's in it because they're getting paid and, and they, 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 they're like a, a submarine, right? They just submerge, disappear, and you see them pop up again. They'll do their job. They submerge and disappear again. Whereas the good ones, um, and, I, and they can be spotted a mile away, the good ones are the ones that stay, be, stay behind when, when there isn't necessarily um, uh, a, meet, a, a customer meeting, but they're still there absorbing what's going on around them. And the number of conversations that we've had about how the company could be run differently or better, just, just, just because we, we care. Right. Yeah, putting the world to rights, but we care. We didn't just go, oh, no, five o'clock, time to go home, off we go, um, yeah. finished now. Um, and I think, again, you can spot that in someone. I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste my time on someone that, that wasn't, didn't, didn't care and wasn't conscientious about the, the greater good. Right? It wasn't just about you and me, actually. It was about the whole company. The reason why we were trying to re-engineer the marketing message is because we wanted it to be better for everybody, not just better yeah. for, for you and me. I, I am curious why you asked that question, Rob, because I, I've been in that situation where I misjudged someone. Like, I was going to ask you for your sort of take on that because I felt like you probably, you know, good, good amount of experience when I've seen that. Well, like, so when I first joined the sales engineering world, I didn't know what I was doing. And they paired me with a guy who's been doing it for 17 years at a different company and they brought him in. Um, so I thought he was the end all be all of all salespeople. I thought he was great until I got to know him a little bit better a few years into it but yeah mm. uh is there a specific question you want to ask otherwise i'll just babble on for like an hour and a half no and no that was it that was it no so, I mean, i'm interested because i i don't know how, i don't know how good a judge i am of people i've never really sat down and thought you know i've got it right you know 800 times out of a thousand I, don't, I, just, I just don't know it's yeah. it's one of those things not really sort of check my gut on it for a long time and um you know I'll let you answer in a second, but I'm kind of going through something as a professional at the moment where I'm having to, you know, make investments in people being a sales leader now. And um, yeah. I'm starting to hire people and I'm starting to look at the things that I'm hiring for and the things that I'm looking out for in people. And it's a massive leap of faith when you try to put your name to someone else's yeah. character. And, and for me, that's a massive, massive kind of, um, uh, it's, it's a big rock thing for me it's like you know this, this is going to take me a long time to kind of work out if there's tweaks i need to make to the way i view how people who, who i should be sort of you know uh, talk you know bringing into my into my team or bringing into my circle of people around me it's professional right it's um it's a it's a, it's a thing i'm going through so i'm interested to hear if you know if people have got it wrong and you, know, well, you, how didn't, wrong. you didn't ask me if i've got it wrong from a team leadership perspective because i've made right. a number of decisions about people that i've hired that was based on on a, a, a set of factors that were unfounded and on trust that weren't followed through that's different to getting to know someone at a peer level and, right. and deciding whether you want or can work with them at a peer level hiring someone basis based on an interview process that's a whole different thing i've made a i made a number of of decisions on hiring people that uh, when I'd gone back and, and then reassessed it, um, I've made a bad decision. I've made some good ones. And you know, there's a couple of people you know and I know that, that have been hired um, into Riverbed um, positions that I've made that, that I still hold up today as the best decisions I've ever made. But then yeah. a couple of people that, that I hired previously were the wrong decisions I ever made. So um, that's different to, to deciding on someone when you work with them rather yeah, than sure. with you. Is that just the reality of the matter that you will make bad decisions and you're going to have to deal with it at some point? Or is there something that Rob can do today to not hire the bad, the wrong person? Um, I think um, if I was to look back and, and uh, assess, I was forced into making quick decisions and I think that was wrong. Yeah. Making quick decisions is always going to end up, like you're going to, you're going to make the wrong decisions. Um, and also 
not assessing someone's skills to a deep enough level going on um, short and early assessment rather than maybe putting them through the, the, the ringer. So I, I, I put Rob through the ringer, if you like, and, and made him earn his, his place in my respect book probably far greater than I did when I was interviewing people for positions because I had opportunity to do that maybe two, three, four times with Rob, whether it be in a direct sales engagement or in a team meeting or in a just a one-to-one -one outside, I was able to judge his ability to deal with those, those situations and I could then form my opinion on him, which actually ultimately was, was right. Whereas if in an interview situation with candidates, it was, I was given maybe one or two times to assess them yeah. and it's far harder to put them through those situations where you can um you can do it that's interesting because you, you would you would think logic would tell you that you met a stranger on the street and versus a, a friend of a friend you would probably take longer to understand if a stranger on the street was worthwhile holding your wallet versus the person that you know is a friend of a friend because a friend of a friend is you know probably a more trustworthy person because you've kind of qualified them one one removed so like having a person internally that you're having to sort of qualify and work out if they're worthy of your kind of time, respect, you know, effort and stuff like that. And then taking longer to work with them to see if they're worth the respect versus the stranger that's just come and chucked a CV in and looking for a job. <laughs> you ultimately put in a position where you have to make a decision. If you've got yeah. an open position and you're typically told you have to fill it, you know, in this day, you know, uh, there are times when sometimes you've got a window, narrowing window of when you can hire someone and you have to make a decision. You know, I've, I've, I've been in a situation where I've had to hire someone because I've been told that the window's closing, hire or not. And, yeah. and if you don't hire, you don't have the head. And it's like, oh, okay, well, I'll hire them. And it's proved to be the wrong thing. Yeah. Um, I think it's the opportunity to put you in the ringer versus like yeah. you, you didn't have the opportunity. Steve didn't have the opportunity to put somebody else in the ringer. He had the opportunity to put you in the ringer. And I've, I'm not a manager, but my hiring manager in the, my previous company had to hire three or four people just because he was pressured into hiring three or four people. Because we need an SE. We need an SE. We need a sales guy. Come on, guys. We, we're going to run out of time. Which is So I read a book by John Kerr. Uh, he's the author of Mastering Technical Sales. He also has a... That's the management handbook. And he discusses the fact that you are hiring people even when there is no spots opening. That gives you the opportunity to connect with them earlier and put them through the ringer. So when the spot opens or if it opens at some point, you know who you're going to hire before you even send out like uh, the recruiter. The, the yeah, best that, that's to great advice. that is great advice. If, I, if, if I'd had my time again as a, a recruiter, as a hiring manager, I think... Um, spending time in the wider um, uh, um, environment of pre-sales, I, I would have been able to spot good pre-sales people to try and onboard them rather yep. than just wait for CV to, to land because you can't tell from a CV. But if you see someone right. in, that, in, in, in the field, whether it's the way they hold themselves in this kind of environment, you know, if, if they do present themselves in, in podcasts or if they present themselves on LinkedIn, you, I should you should spend more time seeing how someone um, represents themselves outside of just that interview process because people can ace interviews, right? If you get the right person at the right time, you can ace an interview because you, you, you fit the spot. I think also that, you know, that what we're talking about here is actually being sort of recognized by, by just our profession on the whole is that there's more and more communities appearing. If you look at, um, I'm not part of it, but you know, maybe one day it will be. You know, Revenue Collective, for example, is a is a big thing globally now. Um, I think they've got sort of nigh on, I think it's thirty thousand, forty thousand members of sort of people in this industry that you know don't necessarily want to talk about each other because they want to get hired for that company, but they want to kind of network and and work out a bit more about other people and what they sort of what they think and feel about stuff that we're talking about here and not have any pressure to be in a set, you know, a sales cycle or a, a hiring process or, a, you know, be forced into the same partner beers, for example, that tends to happen quite a lot. And, you know, there's other communities in the UK, like um, I think sales confidence is one I see quite a bit on, on in LinkedIn. I am kind of interested in that one. And I think there is a, there's more and more people trying to get closer to one another to try and de-risk a lot of things like just generally de-risk relationships 
because professional relationships are, you know, you are you are showing sometimes one half of your personality. So you know you want to de-risk as much of that as you can if you're making a hire, if you're bringing people into your network, you're giving referrals to people, um, and 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 you want to sort of work out where you want to go as well as an individual. Do you you know is the network good for you for you to be able to kind of see what technology trends are out there and see um, you know see see what other people have done to promote themselves. You know I think kind of. <laughs> The, the thing that brought us together was LinkedIn, and I, I, I think that has been the biggest seismic shift in our in our profession. Not technology, but you know the way that we can all find each other and the way we can all share ideas has been brought together by those sort of tools. And those those things are actually, I think, advanced relationships. I think they've advanced people's sales capabilities. I think they've definitely helped me in terms of identifying and attracting talent. So, um, so yeah. Uh, I don't know what the question was. I kind of lost track there, but I think there's a there's a, there's a number of good things that are coming from um, coming coming from generally networking, de-risking, understanding people better, and um, yeah, yeah. I think that was your question, Rob. I didn't ask the question, but sorry, sorry, <laughs> <wasn't> I? I'm <laughs> losing track. It's ten o'clock at night here, and I'm like, you know, uh, I'm moving right. into my class. So, I like, I feel like I like. I say this to every call, but I don't like this is 45 minutes was not enough to actually have a conversation about how you guys work together. But what we've talked about was great. Um, we will move on to the not so fire round. We can do it in a fire round succession because you guys are about to go to bed. Uh, so I think I'll take time. It's cool. Uh, I'm going to change it up a little bit. These are four questions I ask every guest guests and the, the first question is what do you love about sales engineering? But I'm going to change this up and ask, you guys separately, what do you love about what the other per person did as a sales engineer or as a sales manager? So maybe we'll start with Steve. What do you like about Rob? And what, what he did was um, uh, respect what I did uh, and um, make sure that he gave me the airtime to build the respect and position with the customer that I needed in order to um, create that 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 status point, um, rather than just uh, some sales guys that I've experienced want to own the show, and th and that's not Rob. Rob doesn't want to own the show. He wants to make sure that that ev that everybody gets that that space. So um, that's what I'd say about about Rob. Yeah, one thing I enjoyed about Rob so far, although that question is not for me, is that you are truly curious. Like you're here, you're being interviewed, and you're asking a lot of the questions, which is kind of weird as an interviewer. But like, you are curious, and you want to know a little bit more about, well, things that you're curious about, I guess. So, yeah, yeah that, that's a free one. Rob, how about you? Let's, about Steve? Um. Wow. Okay. So I could I could quickly give you a number of things, but I. Uh, just off the top of my head, but I'm probably doing myself and a lot of salespeople out of a job. I'm probably doing Steve's current salesperson out of a job. I felt that Steve trod respectfully in a, into my job. And I mean that like from really sincere, honest place. Uh, and it was welcome, right? I think major account sales is a lonely, difficult place to be as a, as a, as a quota carrying rep because you're getting squeezed left you're getting squeezed right you're getting squeezed down for when's it going to close how, how many accounts have you opened how many things have you done over there with that customer da, 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 all that sort of stuff and i felt that steve moving into my role in kind of the way that we worked took a lot of the pressure off me to kind of do the important things that i needed to do to that, that not a lot of salespeople can get to um i won't it's a different podcast itself about you know what a salesperson should be doing and what a pre you know um what the, the sort of meaningful things that salespeople can be doing if they can get support from other people to free them up to do that but steve freed me up to do the stuff that could move the needle in that account so what are the things that steve took over from you that helped you do that um I'll, I'll give you an example we were working on the the, the, uh, the account that we were sort of referencing through the podcast and I remember it was a very specific um, time in that in that in that deal where it was kind of do or die. And I think one at one point I said to Steve, "Look, I can't come 
to America with you. I, I, I've got this account over here that's doing, I, I don't know what, it was, it was a different account, wasn't it, Steve? I was, I was trying to close a deal over there and it was a big deal going over there. It was probably slightly larger, but I said, look, look I can't leave the country. I need you to go and do client sales, client meetings and technical meetings for me. And that was a big leap of faith for me where I think my line manager, I trusted intimately at the time said, you know, I think you're doing the right thing here. Steve's got your back. Um, but you know, you are, you are making a statement of intent here that you think that Steve can really, really materially influence this, this sort of year changing deal for the company. And I said, look, if it, if, if my gut feels right here, Steve won't just, um, you know, move, move the needle first. He'll, he'll, he'll come back with more than I probably could have because he'll have had the space for me not to harass and pester him every 10 minutes to be able to think and do the things that he knows to be able to close that deal sooner or, or, or in a, in a better qualified way for us. And I could go off and, you know, work on a separate opportunity of a similar size to help the company even more, even more. So freeing me up to do things that multiply my influence on the company was just, you can't buy, you cannot buy that sort of um, support. You can't, um, you can't, you don't have it everywhere and you can't necessarily replicate it. But when you get that, it, it, it really makes a salesperson feel that they have, you know, some superpowers because you can be in two places at once. All right. Um, is that common? Well, it's not common, but should it be more common for SEs to be able to do more sales Z stuff to actually, I'm, I'm veering away from the not, not so far. And I guess we're not going through that. Uh, but this is, seems like an interesting topic. Should SEs uh, be a little bit more salesy to help out? Well, you know, I think, I think I'm not gonna, I was going to chuck out like a, just a broad brush, like made up stat there. But like, if you say you've got a, a company of a thousand people, probably in a region of 200 of them are going to be some sort of in some sort of quota carrying sort of quasi quota carrying role. And a hundred of them will probably be you know, hundred or so of them will be like me and a hundred or so of them will be like Steve. Imagine if you could have 200, you know, 150 because not pre-sales is not sales, by the way. Imagine if you could have 150 manpower, you know, sales people, if you could make your sales engineers, half a salesperson they're not a sales they're not going to go out and prospect and they're not going to go out and um you know open doors because that's not what the time is spent doing but imagine if you, if you could enable your sales engineers just that little bit more to be able to essentially get some pretty large returns on on that headcount i not i don't think that's an unreasonable ask i think a sales a sales engineer would probably from my experience, the pre-sales engineers I've worked with, I'll give a shout out to a guy like Dan Moss, for example. Absolutely. You know, like a Dan Moss, who's uh, one of the best in the industry. You know, he's probably, he looks like Steve and he... <laughs> of half you know, he's probably younger and better looking than me, but yeah. yeah. And, and, and I feel that it's just an untapped pit of potential in, in a lot of sales, in a lot of sales focused companies. And I, I, I'm not going to sort of, paint by numbers here because it's not fair on the individual but I, I feel that when I've spoken to you know the vast majority of sales engineers they're capable and they're willing because they feel that it's their duty to support the sales organization to get to the number so why not spend more time you know leaning into that conversation and just making sales engineers sales and uh, you know technical sales uh, technical people now, I think I think the clue is in the name, right? You, you, there are systems engineers, and there are sales engineers, uh, and I think there's a there's a distinction between the two. A systems engineer is a great technical resource. If you point him at a solution, a problem, he will come up with a solution, without a doubt. The best ones do. They'll always solve a problem, and they'll get a sale because they've solved a technical problem. They've got a POC through to conclusion. The customer buys it because it does what it says he said it will do. But a sales engineer may take what was a situation where technically the solution was 80% of, of a fit, but got it through to a close because he was able to identify the problems he was there to solve, the business challenges he was there to solve and align to the business problem. Don't look at it as a technical problem. And I think that's the difference between a sales engineer and a systems engineer. Dan is a great example of that. 
where he mm. will look at a problem and think there's the outcome I need to hit. doesn't necessarily matter how I get there, but the outcome is what I've got to go for and will achieve it. So I think, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the, the difference. And, and you won't always find a good sales engineer. You can find a good systems engineer, but a sales engineer I think is worth double what, what a systems engineer is. I'm going to need to meet this Dan. Uh, so yeah, I'm okay. going to, two more questions. Go on, go on. Sorry. I was going to say, we can, we can hook you up with Dan. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, so is there a book or resource that sales engineers should be uh, exposed to maybe to be better, become better sales engineers or salespeople? Well, hang on. Let me go to my, my bookshelf. Hang on. I've got mine here. Um, you're going to, you're going to know what it is. Master in technical sales. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one. You got it. Uh, I was introduced. To, oh, and that one and this one. Down straight to one. Yep. Those two books are great books. And when I was a leader, they were the two books I'd recommend anyone coming into the industry that they should pick up and, and understand. Um, so if you're reading a book, you've got the same. <laughs> Look at that. It's almost like we, we knew what we were doing, right? Um, so, so, so one of the best stories I've got is, is a, um, in, in pre-sales leadership was we had a guy um, who Rob knows who was a, a tech support guy who came in for, a, for an interview into pre-sales uh, and absolutely bombed his first interview. Didn't get it, didn't, it just was just too technical. Uh, and I actually told him to go away and, and get the, the master in technical sales book. He basically absorbed it cover to cover, came back, interviewed and absolutely smashed the interview because he totally understood the sales process, the value of pre-sales, the value of sales and pitched to us a, uh, as, as a, an interview panel um, like he was a, as a pre-sales engineer, not just as a systems engineer. So yeah, that, that's definitely the book I would say um, if you were going to read one, read that. Nice. Rob, do you have any one that you recommend? I'm not, I'll be honest, I'm not the most sort of booky sort of person. You could probably search around this house and you'd probably find no books. Um, what, what I am though is I, I just go for content online. Like I go through it like, uh, like, like water. I would, I would say go and follow a company called Force Management. Force Management, are a, they, they, do, they do both sales and technical sales training. Um, but you know, some of the best sales organizations in the world trust, you know, force management. I'm probably sound like I'm on commission for them, but I, I felt that in my sales career, that was the tipping point for me in terms of really kind of getting an understanding of why, why I'm in the room and when I shouldn't be in the room. You know, that was, that was really a, uh, a really, really kind of valuable resource and valuable, um, a valuable thing for me to be part of, not just read, but be part of you know, the, the, the training they, they provide me with and the content they publish online on LinkedIn is, 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 is it comes from a place of not just talking about it, doing it. Nice. All right. I appreciate you guys being here. Um, this was an amazing conversation. And that's it. That is the show. It was a long one. And we talked for a lot longer afterwards. And it was late at night, their time. And it was just fun. And like I said at the, in the intro, it was just fun listening to them talk and highlight each other's strengths and talking about, like, this is what you did so great and this is what you did so great. And I feel as someone who was just watching it, I had a lot to learn. The, the biggest takeaway is that great sales engineering teams, sorry, great sales teams, which include a salesperson and a sales engineer, they can work together very well but also they can work separately very well like an se can handle a meeting without having the salesperson there and a salesperson can handle answering some technical questions without having the se there that that was just great to see great to watch and they seem to be very successful in what they did and you know i i i wish rob i, I wish all my guests all the best and in, including steve and and Rob, I the content that they provided for this week it was it was a lot of fun for me to listen to. So uh, another housekeeping item is if your job has been affected by Corona, we are doing what is called Leave No SE Behind initiative. 
it seems that a few people that were on the on that i've only done six so far a few of them have received formal offers which is great i would love to take credit for all of that but they did a lot of work i was just able to help and highlight them a little bit they 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 did a lot of work to actually get the job so i'm very i'm very happy for those people who have been able to secure roles so congrats to you guys you know who i'm talking about and uh, with that i will see you guys next time peace oh sorry this is Ramsey for the Invisible Benny signing off.